Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom Miller. I have the honor and privilege of being the director here at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences, Chesapeake Biological Lab in Solomons. And I want to welcome you to the last of our five Science for Citizens presentations. Uh, for those who have been regular attendees, you'll know that these scientific talks have been given regularly at CBL five in the springtime and five in the autumn for over a decade. And when the COVID pandemic hit, uh, we tried to think of a way to capture the spirit of a Science for Citizens series and also capture the opportunity to showcase our research at our open houses. And so we developed the idea of hosting a virtual science semester and these Science for Citizens talks are now part of that virtual science semester. For those of you who want more information, if you go to www.umces.edu and type in virtual science semester, you'll be taken to our website and you'll find there that there are five elements of our virtual science semester the first being these presentations, the Science for Citizens presentations. Another being um, CBL behind the scenes, where you can see videos of um, our faculty and staff conducting their research, including Chris Rao um, giving a tattoo to a b baby terrapin. Um, there are also interviews with former alumni uh, who talk about the lasting impact that their education at CBL has had on their career. And shortly, though, we'll be joined by interviews with some of our current students who talk about their hopes and aspirations for the education that they are receiving at CBL and how it will impact their future career. And then somewhat in response to the tremendous pressure that the educational system is under, we also have a Science at Home series which focuses on middle school science projects that can be conducted safely at home. We're able to bring you all of these from the generous support of three sponsors who normally sponsor our Science for Citizens uh, lecture series. Uh, they are PNC Bank, Southern Maryland Toyota, and Team Hyundai. And rather than supporting the tea, coffee, and cookies, that we normally serve at our public seminars, uh, they generously allowed their funding to be used to help develop this science for this virtual science semester and the science for citizens lectures that this is a part. Um, tonight uh, is the final of our five series in the autumn, and it always surprises me uh, every year we've done this that we start off in late September and it's a bright evening. And by the time we finish in the end, towards the end of October, uh, the nights have closed in and it's dark outside. So even though we may be struggling with a health pandemic, the seasonal change remains the same. And for me, this last seminar in the series really marks the end of the summer season and the beginning of autumn and the dark days of wi wi winter. So to try and shed some light on the dark days of winter, um, we have a presentation tonight on uh, plastic in the environment. And uh, it focuses on both the, the distribution of plastic in the environment and some of the activities that CBL has been undertaking to try and reduce the amount of plastic in the environment by working with local restaurants to try and understand um, sources of plastic and control those sources of plastic. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Karis Mitchellmore, who's one of the uh, co-investigators on this project, along with several other CBL um, faculty members. Karis, like me, hails from across the pond. Um, she interviewed uh, at, CB at CBL in 2001, in fact, in September in 2001, and, and had an extended stay with us after all the flights were canceled following the terrible terrorist attack. Um, and even though she stayed here for a week, she decided to come a anyway, and we're absolutely delighted that, that, that she did. Karis conducts a range of research on environmental toxicology, 
Most recently, she's been looking at the effects of sunscreens on corals. Many of you may know there's a lot of public policy at the moment being undertaken on re regulating sunscreens because of concerns to the health of corals. And Caris has been conducting a lot of the science trying to provide objective, independent research that will inform that public policy debate. Um, today, she's looking at another part of her research portfolio, and that is plastic in the environment. And so it is my uh, extreme pleasure to introduce Dr. Karis Mitchellmore, who will talk about plastics in the coastal environment. Karis, over to you. I should say, while Karis is, is getting herself set up, um, because this is a Zoom conference and not a Zoom call, you will not be able to unmute your microphones. Um, but if you have a question and want to type it into the text box, um, I will moderate questions at the end of the evening. Karis. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, hope everybody can see that and hear me OK. Yep. Uh, okay, perfect. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so thank you for that great introduction and welcome everybody um, to the last of our virtual uh, seminar series. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm going to be presenting today on two projects that uh, Dr. Helen Bailey is the, uh, uh, the project investigator for. And as Tom mentioned, there's a, a number of us here at CDL who are working on these um, projects and also other colleagues at the uh, Appalachian Lab as well. So I wanted to start with uh, the first slide on rubber duckies here, just to bring us into the issue surrounding plastic pollution. Um, and this just highlights just how far plastic can travel around the globe. So this was a spill um, where a, uh, a ship left China in 1992 and uh, basically uh, 29,000 rubber duckies fell off the ship and uh, they drifted around in the, in the Pacific. And as you can see from this graph, some of these uh, ducks went north and some of them went south. And throughout the years, they've been finding them at different locations. So they found over 19,000 of these went south and they washed up in the shores of Australia, Indonesia, South America, then 15 years later, uh, 17,000 miles later, they also found them on uh, some British beaches. So it's just you know, a really nice case study just to show you, you know, how far plastics can actually transport throughout the uh, globe. So with it, um, just putting the plastic into context, of course, you know, we all go out onto beaches and you can see you know, an array of different types of trash a number of cans, plastic bottles, styrofoam, food containers, plastic straws, cigarette butts, uh, balloons, and uh, toothbrushes, and then that really freaky photo with the doll's head there, doll's shoes, lots of flip-flops. Um, and of course, the issue is in plastics is that depending on the type of plastic, these can take a long time to biodegrade. Some, in fact, will never biodegrade. And the other thing about plastics is that they can break down um, over, over time into smaller pieces, and that's where you might have heard the term microplastics that we'll talk about later. The other issue with styrofoam containers, they are really not biodegradable, they're really light, and so you know, somebody might put them in the trash can, and then with wind they can blow out, so they're moved across land, um, and they float on water, so you know, this, they, they transport um, a long way from their, their origin. And again, these can also break down into tiny pieces. Of course, I don't have the audience in front of me, and I would normally be asking the question, what did I leave out there? So there's you know, one major plastic group there that is left out, and that is, of course, your plastic bags. And I really like this figure um, just because it really highlights just what some of the uh, animals in the ocean actually see when they see a plastic bag. So turtles, one of the main food sources for turtles is jellyfish. And so you can see this figure on the left here, there's a mix there of actual jellyfish, and then this is a plastic bag. And so you can see with the figure on the right, 
this turtle is mistaking a plastic bag for a jellyfish and is trying to consume it. So that's a, a, you know, a brief introduction to plastic pollution. Um, so how did we actually get here? And I would like to point out there was a documentary that uh, one of my colleagues was also um, a part of, The Plastic Ocean. If you Google it, there's a, um, you can uh, pull it up. There's actually a three minute uh, trailer for it and it was released in 2016. So that's a nice actual video that encompasses a lot of the things that we're gonna talk today. So it was actually way back in 1869 when synthetic plastic was invented by John Wesley Hyatt. And it wasn't until the 1933 where polyethylene was um, started to be used much more commonly and it was actually created by accident. In the 50s and the 60s, this is really when plastic, uh, single-use plastic gained its popularity. And you can see all sorts of advertisements in uh, newspapers and magazines. You know, this is the handy wrap here, you know, 100 football. You've got a hand, 100 sa sandwiches um, that you can wrap. This is my favorite. Uh, best things in life come in cellophane. Um, not sure what people would think about that one today. And then when uh, the uh, advertisement for Dixie Cups here, um, they, you know, moving away from just the, the, the paper cups and lining them with plastic. And the, the advertisement there is, well, you know, you don't get the cardboard taste uh, anymore. And then of course the plastic bags. And, you know, this was a plastic bag advertising all the different things you could do with these plastic bags. They're, they're amazing. But in the 1970s, environmentalists became first concerned with the use of single-use plastic, and this continued in the 1980s. There was much more stories in the popular culture and in uh, academic research going on on the problems um, and issues with single-use plastic. And this is when we start seeing, you know, photos popping up like this. This is why I'm sure if any of you have got children, your children's, children will come home um, and say, hey, Bob, you know, we must... We must cut the six pack of plastics and uh, in fact a, a lot of companies have moved away from these um, six pack plastics and using more um, uh, compostable type uh, materials. And then in the 1990s uh, there was growing concern um, among the scientists. It was still not on most people's radar though and this image is from um, uh, Charles Moore who discovered the, you know, the Great Pacific um, garbage patch that I'm sure you've all heard about, and this was uh, in 1997. And then ever since then, there's been, uh, in the 2000s, there's been increasing research conducted, um, issues relating to human health, what exactly the scale of plastic impacts are, and then the first bans for different single-use items were coming into play. And so, you know, you can see this research here back in 2001 saying about the detrimental um, effects of plastic. I don't know if any of you remember the bisphenol A story and uh, due to public pressure, you know, that was removed from a, from a lot of the um, items. Hormone mimics, plastic bottles are, have hormone mimics. So, you know, a lot of research coming out covering a lot of different health impacts from plastics. And then, of course, continuation in, with pictures like this. You can see this poor bird is just chock full of all these different plastic caps, all different types of disposable single plastic items. And then, um, and now, you know, the, uh, there's a lot more um, uh, talking about human health issues. I mean, they found plastic debris in little microplastics, in tap water, bottled water, beer, uh, that's crossing the limit. Uh, sea salt and also honey, a whole array of different food products have been found to contain little pieces of plastic. Um, recently, it was uh, estimated there was like millions of tiny particles in a, in a cup of tea. Um, and so there's been a lot of um, uh, reports and interest talking about you know, what is the human health impact of this and um, publications and, and articles, as you can see here, you know, what goes into the ocean goes in you, a lot of public awareness. Um, they found microplastics in poop. Um, doesn't say what organism, but I'm pretty sure it was uh, human poop they were looking that in. Um, and there's been people that have been estimating um, and doing the math and stating things like, you know, by 2050, there'll be more plastic than fish in the world's oceans. And you know, even the National Geographic ran a study, um, which was a pretty striking picture, actually, looking at uh, 
uh, a plastic bag in the ocean and uh, uh, likening it to uh, the, uh, the iceberg there and the plastic bag underneath. Um, so now the question is, you know, where are we at in the, in the 2020s? So what are some of the main pollution impacts? As you can see from all of these pictures, obviously things like physical entrapment and entanglement is um, key. Um, and also suffocation. So, you know, unfortunately, you'll find a myriad of different pictures um, like this uh, on the internet. The other things um, the plastics can do, the smaller plastic items can be mistaken for food. And so organisms actually ingest them. And so they might actually think they're food particles and, and, and take them in. Um, or they might just be a byproduct of taking in um, uh, dietary items and then they put the plastics with it. So this can obviously be lethal. You've seen the pictures before, you know, the bird here, you know, a lot of plastic items. That's obviously blocked its digestive system and, you know, that could be obviously a lethal consequence. Um, but there are uh, other consequences, consequences that can occur. Um, it might not kill them outright, but, you know, the organism is going to have a stomach that feels full. Of course, there's no nutritional value. So you can have these organisms starve. You can have growth reduction. And of course, it'll impact um, all sorts of other normal processes as well. So where do we all fit into this? Um, so of course, you know, we're individuals, consumers, voters, community members, educators, parents, mentors, you know, as a society, how do we fit, fit into this? And, you know, you can see there's a little bit of a disconnect with um, the plastic pollution story is that, you know, we, we assume when we throw something away, it goes away. And obviously, it doesn't go away. It it just goes and uh, to you know different places and uh, um, could even change, break down. But it doesn't go away. And I'm sure you're all um, aware of the you know the slogans which have been you know all these different R's keep coming in. You know, first thing to do: refuse plastic, single-use plastic, reduce your use of single-use plastic, reuse your plastic repurpose it, make it into, I mean, there's been a you know, slew of businesses that are taking, um, I'm sure you've all seen the bags and said, I used to be a plastic bottle. So, you know, repurpose these um, plastic items, reinvent, you know, do something different with them. But the one thing I want to point out is that you can see in this whole list of items, recycling's at the bottom, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, we'll get to that next. But, you know, we always, you know, quite often I'll hear people say, well, it's only one plastic bottle. Well, you know, and what difference is one plastic bottle going to make? Well, if, if everybody said that, that's 7 billion people. That's 7 billion plastic bottles. The individual makes a difference. So getting back to this recycling um, issue, you know, you notice that this is recycling is at the very bottom of that list there. And that is basically because 9% of plastic waste has been recycled. Um, so, uh, you know, you always think it's a much bigger number than that. It's actually only 9% of total plastic waste has been recycled. 12% of it has been incinerated. 79% of it is in landfills or in the environment. So, you know, I pose a question. You know, I'm sure you all are aware of your plastic bottles, you turn them over, or your plastic items. You see this little triangle, the recycling triangle, and you'll see a little number in it as well. It'll tell you what type of plastic it is. So a lot of people believe that all items with a triangle of animals, uh, animals, arrows can be recycled. But the actual truth is that all items with a triangle of animals cannot be recycled. There's actually only a few types of plastics that actually can be recycled. And uh, getting back to the numbers, those are usually the ones that have those numbers that are one, two, and, and sometimes five. And the other key thing about plastics is that a lot of people do not realize is that they can, they can only be recycled for a limited number of times. Not infinitely, glass and metal, you can keep cleaning that, keep recycling it. But with plastics, you don't because they tend to break down every time you go through that recycling um, and repurposing process. And so essentially, when you recycle a plastic, it's basically only delaying their entry into the waste um, stream. So looking at the different types of plastic, these are the different types of plastics here. So you'll see things uh, like the number one on soda bottles. This is polyethylene um, phthalate. You'll see the HDPE, the high density, density polyethylene. These are your detergent bottles. This is number two. 
Um, you'll see PVC. Um, obviously, these are things that you're very used to. You, the plumbing pipes, for example, um, and that's number three. You also see polyethylene, or it's also called low uh, density um, polyethylene, and these are the plastic bags. That's number. That's number four. Uh, polypropylene um, is number five, and that tends to be things like straws. Polystyrene, there's those takeout containers, that's number six. And then there's also nylon, you know, poly polyamide, um, which is things like uh, DVDs, for example. So again, just to highlight, you know, your plastic bottle, it can go into recycling, um, and uh, it can be made into something else, you know, repurposed, like as I mentioned earlier, into a, into a bag. But eventually that bag will, um, obviously you'll be using it a number of times, but it'll eventually go to um, disposal facilities and that plastic is no longer um, uh, recyclable. So why does, why, does it, why does it matter? What's the other issue about plastic um, pollution? Obviously plastic um, is, is made from oil or petroleum, which is a fossil, fossil fuel, of course. And, you know, that is, uh, oil is formed over millions of years from dead plants and animals um, that were buried under the sediment. And the key thing about petroleum is it is a limited resource. Um, and uh, this diagram here on the um, right here is showing you, you know, plastic, uh, oops, sorry, excuse me, uh, uh, the plastic use and um, disposal here. You can see the majority is in the landfill. And only that little blue circle there Again, highlighting the very small amount that goes into recycling. But the other thing is uh, producing and incinerating plastics, so that, that's 79% there, produces carbon dioxide that can contribute to um, climate change. So just uh, highlighting in on that figure, where do plastics go? You know, the total amount of um, uh, plastic is there on the left-hand side. And uh, a lot of it is used just once. So there are some plastic that is, you know, still in use, but uh, the large proportion of it is only used once. And the majority of that is discarded. So again, in the landfills or in the environment, another percentage, a, a smaller percentage is incinerated. And the smallest right down there in the blue is uh, recycled. And so recycled and still in use is literally 0.1% uh, 0.1 tons of that uh, total material. So again, just getting at that fact that very little amount of the plastic can actually be uh, recycled. And this is again highlighted here. So this is to show you um, the cumulative plastic waste generation and disposal. It's in million metric tons here. And you can see all the primary waste generated from plastic is around 25,000 uh, million tons. Uh, a lot of that is discarded, some incinerated, and uh, some of it's recycled. But the real take home of po point that I want to get from this graph for you is just look at the time scale on the bottom. And you can see this rapid use and rapid uh, disposal of plastics in the last few uh, decades. So, of course, we have plastics everywhere. Uh, it's been estimated there's a number of studies that have been looking at plastic pollution in the, in the ocean. Um, and there was a study in 2014 saying that, uh, you know, over 5 trillion pieces of plastic are floating around in the ocean. It's estimated nearly 12 million uh, metric tons of plastic um, entered the ocean from land in the coastal regions just in 20, uh, 20, 2010 alone. Um, and, you know, plastic debris everywhere. You know, we have plastic debris and micro, microplastics here in the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, a colleague of mine at uh, College Park, uh, Lance Yonkos, Lance Yonkos, published an um, article in 2014 just showing the concentration of microplastics in various rivers um, around Chesapeake Bay. And in 2015, the uh, United States has the highest per capita use of plastics over 100 kilogram per person uh, per year. So I want to, with that introduction, I just wanted to move you into describing the first study here that um, has been uh, conducted uh, by uh, Dr. Helen Bailey, uh, myself and the uh, others uh, listed on the uh, front page. So this was a called Plastic Watch. It's a pilot study to reduce single use plastics in Solomon's Maryland. 
So this was in collaboration with local restaurants to determine plastic use and cost. Um, and the goal was to test the performance of non-plastic alternative straws and also a variety of takeout containers in three local restaurants here. The, the project developed a questionnaire and also a number of different outreach materials um, that were distributed to the restaurants and to um, the uh, patrons of the restaurant. And the study was funded by NOAA and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So for any of you who are not familiar with um, Solomon's Island, then of course we're in Southern Maryland and uh, right here, I don't want to press some cases to, but you can see we're in Southern Maryland here and we're right at the end here before you would go over the bridge into um, St. Mary's um, County. And you know, this is uh, the pier restaurant here. So this is the Solomon's Boardwalk. And I'm sure I'm probably one of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who have exactly the same picture um, uh, on their uh, uh, iPhone. So here are the restaurants that participated. We had two main groups. We had an experimental group, and these were the restaurants that were given the um, alternative products. And then, um, as with any great science experiment, you have a control group. And uh, so these were the restaurants that we did not give those um, items to. And, uh, you know, they were, um, they had their own products. Um, and uh, so this is why we had these two um, participating groups. So there's the CD Cafe, Lotus Kitchen, and the Pier, who are an experimental cohort. And the um, control group was Kingfishers, Island Hideaway, and uh, the Red Duck. So one of the first things um, that came out of this uh, project is to, to, to enhance public awareness. Um, so the, the uh, website, there was also posters and leaflets and flyers all put up in the restaurants. And this is just the uh, flyer on the um, left here. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it tells you a little bit about the project, what the goal of the project is, and it highlights, you know, what are some of the things can you do to um, reduce uh, single-use plastics? And so you can see on the right there, the top, the top right figure is, you can see that that poster is uh, nicely displayed on the front door in the uh, pier restaurant. Um, in the, uh, the bottom left, that is at uh, the uh, Lotus Kitchen and uh, the third restaurant there on, on the right. So there was these public displays of these posters just telling everybody about um, the, the project. And uh, so if anybody is interested, this is up on uh, the website, the Plastic Watch website, unseas.edu uh, slash Plastic Watch. And that gives you a lot more details of the project than um, I can do uh, tonight. So uh, during this, as well as having this public outreach and the, and the posters, um, the, uh, there was a questionnaire sent um, and uh, uh, the, uh, we had over 146 respondents to the online survey um, after they had used these products or, or, or not at the restaurant. So 146 people responded to their online survey about you know, what do you think of these different products? And so there's a variety of different categories here I'm gonna uh, walk you through. So one of the first questions was, did customers like the alternatives? So, um, you know, the alternatives were those paper straws versus the plastic straws um, and the different takeout um, containers. And you can see the vast majority um, were very satisfied um, with the alternative um, products. Some slightly satisfied um, and, you know, a couple reported, you know, very dissatisfied. Didn't like the, the paper straws um, compared to the usual plastic straws. Uh, one of the other questions was uh, interesting, so asking uh, the consumer, are they willing to go without a straw? And you can see the vast majority of people actually said yes. So this is a very different approach. Before we were asking them, you know, well, let's not use your plastic straw, let's use a paper straw, when probably the first approach should be, well, how about just don't go with a straw? How about no straw? And you can see the vast majority preferred that option than the alternative paper um, option earlier. And another building in on this um, paper, uh, this paper straw um, alternative, we also asked the question, did you bring a reusable straw? And you can see most people said no, um, but there are some people that are carrying around, you know, they have their reusable straws and they sometimes use them and a couple of respondents said, yes, they always use their reusable straws. 
And another question was trying to gauge um, the, uh, what people thought about plastics in the, the ocean. What, what, did they, what did they know? One of the, the main questions asked was, you know, how long does it take for a plastic water bottle to break down? Of course, I normally ask all of you that question um, before showing you, you this data. Um, and the most common response was actually correct. It is approximately 450 years, but there were 20% of respondents that underestimated the time it takes for a plastic water to, or, to break down. Few thought uh, four years, quite a number of people thought, thought 40, uh, 45 years. And of course, you know, the biggest concern for restaurants is, you know, how much are these alternatives gonna cost me? Um, for example, paper straws cost about four times as much as plastic straws. But of course, the straw use can be reduced. So you could end up with zero cost if that, that is an option. Uh, interestingly, there's, relatively, um, there's a relatively small cost difference between paper and styrofoam takeout containers. The paper containers are around 0.16 um, uh, dollars, uh, whereas the, uh, the styrofoam at 12 cents each. Um, and so, you know, not, not too different there, but, you know, that can make a big difference to, to um, especially a small biz business's profit margin. Um, although the, uh, there's a number of uh, counties, even within Maryland, that have banned styrofoam, um, a number of states have. So, you know, this is something that they are going to have to look at alternatives pretty seriously moving forward. Um, there's also a small cost difference between sugarcane and plastic takeout. Um, containers, three cents versus um, two cents, respectively. So, you know, it used to be that a lot of these different alternative products were a lot more expensive, and this seems to be coming a lot, um, this seems to be uh, reducing um, the cost in, in, in time, but it's still an additional cost. Keep in mind, it's still an additional cost for that restaurant owner. Um, and it wasn't just, this project wasn't just about, you know, public awareness and outreach and, and talking to the, um, the uh, consumers. It was also meeting with the different restaurant um, owners and asking them, you know, a number of questions. So, you know, asking them, will you continue to use the biodegradable products? Everybody said yes. Um, you know, what are some of the different vendors that you liked? Um, a lot of people like the, the pack and wood um, straws. Um, how satisfied were you with the products? You know, eight, nine, ten out of ten there. Um, and did you think the customers were satisfied, satisfied with the products? And, you know, scores of nine there, the lowest one, um, seven. And, you know, would they continue working with us? Of course, everybody said yes, so that, that was great to hear. Okay, so if any of you has been walking along, um, the other part of this, again, you know, there's a lot went to public outreach. Um, and part of this project was to place some um, signage um, out on the Solomon's Boardwalk. And so signs have been placed um, by the uh, Calvert uh, Board of uh, County Commissioners. Printed signs were installed by uh, Calvert County with assistance from Calvert Marine Museum. So next time we go and walk along the Solomon's Boardwalk, keep an eye out for these signs. There's one near the um, Children's Play Park. That's the sign one there, right up there on the um, top um, of the boardwalk. There's another sign right near the, the gazebo part in the middle of the um, boardwalk. And then there's also a third one. Um, it was originally uh, going to be um, placed at the end, uh, past the, the pier, but is now actually um, on the north side of, of the pier there. So uh, a little bit um, further down than um, uh, sign two. So keep an eye out for them. Um, and this is a picture here. So this is Dr. Helen Bailey with her daughters. And uh, so these, these are the signs. This first one um, in the top is the one by the um, play park, the ice cream place. And uh, the other one on the bottom is the one by um, the gazebo. So what was the goal of these signs? So it was a public education just to tell people, you know, how do plastics get into the, the Chesapeake Bay? You know, walking through you know, how they get in, you know, the land to uh, water transport. Um, and then, you know, asking questions such as, you know, what, why should we care about that? Um, and, you know, walking through, you know, talking about, you know, impacts on birds. You can see all these different icons there. You know, impacts on birds here. You know, impacts to marine mammals, impacts to turtles. And, you know, showing here how, um, you know, a plastic bag on the land with wind and rain 
can end up um, in uh, the water. And then this here is depicting how you know, a plastic bottle can break down into um, smaller microplastics that you know, organisms will take in and ingest. But of course, the goal is, as well as just telling people what the problem is, you know, there has to be a solution. And so you'll see throughout all of these um, posters that, you know, we, we address it, what can you do? You know, and the suggestions such as, you know, skip the straws, plastic bags, and take out items. You know, uh, participate in beach commun or community cleanup events. Um, and again, the link to the website um, is also on all of them. So we talk about the, the movement of plastics. We can talk about reducing plastic waste. You know, what are some of the things that you can do? So this is the uh, the other sign, and again, just talking about um, you know re reusable items, skipping single use items, bringing your own containers, using reusable bags, and again, links to the uh, website. And the third one actually talks about microplastics, and you know describes how the plastics break up. Um, into the, in the environment, it talks about how long it takes, it talks about some of the items that will do that. Um, so you can see here a great depiction of a um, the plastic bottle fragmenting over time into you know, medium sized pieces and then these small um, sized pieces. Again, you know, trying to highlight also how long this um, takes the breakdown in the environment. You can see plastic bottle 450 years, plastic straw 200 years. For plastic cups, 50 years, plastic bags, 20 years. And, in, uh, and again, offering um, advice for potential solutions to reduce this. Uh, so I just wanted to touch on here, um, uh, Ryan, uh, Dr. Ryan Woodland gave uh, one of the uh, Science for Citizens talks the other week, talking about the um, cruises that have been going on with Rachel Carson on the Patuxent River. Well, part of this, um, one of the uh, endpoints is also to look at plastics um, in the in the uh, Patuxent River. So this were, were pictures from a uh, cruise on the 28th of March, and you can see uh, there's, uh, there's Sarah in the uh, top uh, right there, and a number of students and others helping doing the trawl um, on, as they're going along the Patuxent and then taking it and sorting it and looking at it for the different types of plastics. And this is just an image here of some of the plastic debris that was found in the Patuxent River. So you can see there's some styrofoam pieces, there's a little hard plastic frag fragment there in the left, and then there's a, there's a, a microfiber um, piece of plastic. And yet there was a lot of other pieces of plastic that at first look were really hard to see that they were actually plastic, because once these things are in the, in the environment, they get, they get fouled by um, bacteria, bacteria attached to them, algae attached to them, and they get coated with all sorts of organic material. So sometimes it's actually pretty hard, and then they all start um, sticking together. So sometimes it's really hard to see, you know, what, what, where's the plastic in underneath um, all of this. And so moving on to why I, I didn't talk about this earlier, um, the uh, polyester is because that microfiber there uh, one of the um, biggest sources and, uh, of uh, plastic actually comes from clothing. Um, so go ahead, check your label. If it's polyester, that is uh, plastic. And so lots of microfibers go in and out, uh, of the, go into the uh, environment through wastewater um, treatment plants. And so every time you do a, you know, a load of washing, then um, especially the first load, the first time you wash an item, um, estimated that you know there's, there's thousands of different um, uh, fibers that they're small um, but there's loads of different fiber particles that are being released from your clothes in fact it was estimated that uh, in every wash you might release about 729,000 pieces of acrylic fibers um, polyester nearly half a million per and this is per wash per person keep in mind um, and so you can see that you know there's a um, and actually, it was showing that fabric condition actually increases the risk um, of uh, fibers. And over time, these fibers tend to decrease if you just look at uh, how many times you've washed your clothes. Like I said, it's that first wash of your clothing that really re releases um, a, a number of uh, fibers. But every wash, you're releasing nearly a million types of um, microfibers into that wastewater stream. 
So talking about wastewater, um, these are some of the plastics that have been found in wastewater. And uh, so, you know, you have your foam products and this, this image here just shows you uh, what they, they look like under the microscope. Um, again, you know, th these aren't in instantly recognizable as to what they originally were because they've been broken down into lots of small um, pieces. And also they can be fouled by, um, like I said, different organisms. So, you know, sometimes it's uh, pretty hard to see what they were. But there's foam, there's all sorts of pieces of fragment, there's a little, there's a little pellet. Remember um, microbeads, little plastic microbeads, um, which were phased out and banned a, a number of years ago. You can still see uh, some of these, you can see fibers. Um, and you can see from the, uh, the pie diagram here, by far, the, in terms of numbers of particles, by far the number that's highest is the fibers. Over 80% of those particles were um, microfibers. So I wanted to move on uh, to describe the last project. Um, this is a wafer plastic educational project. This is a NOAA BWET three-year project um, running from 2018 through 2021. It's called the wave of plastic. And again, as I mentioned, Dr. Helen Bailey is the uh, PI on this, together with myself, Kat, um, uh, Dr. Kat Skalinski from uh, AL, Dr. Michael Gonzier here from CBL, Sarah, Jenna, Jamie, and, and Nicole um, from CBL and uh, Appalachian Lab as well. So the goal of this project is uh, teacher training uh, for middle school teachers in both Calvert and St. Mary's school systems. And this is a development and implementation of new classroom materials and, feed, and field work pertaining to this plastic pollution. Um, and so the whole goal was to increase you know, environmental literacy, um, particularly in terms of plastic pollution. So this is that wave of plastic curricular unit that was developed. Um, and to help foster stewardess between you know, the students and, and, and local um, communities. So this is the team, as I mentioned, you see everybody uh, here, um, number um, of colleagues from uh, CBL and uh, AL. And of course, you know, it wouldn't happen without the uh, contribution from the St. Mary's and uh, Calvert County uh, middle school um, teachers. And, and as I mentioned, Helen uh, Bailey is, uh, is uh, the lead for this uh, project. So again, this is a collaboration between UMSEs and the uh, county public schools. And you can just see some images here from some workshops. Um, and so this is developing uh, the curricular unit, the program which has been developed now. That was the uh, last um, couple of years. And uh, uh, you know, both myself and, and Michael Gonzi are giving talks on different aspects of uh, plastic pollution from the chemistry, the biodegradation side of Michael. Um, covers and myself, I'm focused on the um, aquatic uh, toxicology pollution side of things. So a number of teachers um, participated in these uh, workshops and they ran from one day to multiple day um, workshops. So this is, um, and this is all on the website as well, um, but I just wanted to give you an example here. You know, this is an example of a, a unit um, in this wave of plastic program. So there'd be, you know, we'd start with lesson one, you know, a planet full of plastic, talk about, you know, some of the background that I've given you today, and then describe in more details, you know, what exactly is plastic, and then talk about how plastic moves in the environment, you know, from, from the hand to the land to the sea. You know, then talk a little bit about the impacts, you know, each of these is a curricular unit, talk about impacts on aquatic organisms, and then the last section is, what can we do? You know, what's, what, what can we do to make a difference and to uh, reduce the uh, impact? And the, the arrow underneath just shows you some examples of things, um, uh, you know, example of experiments and, and things that the, the students actually um, uh, conduct. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll talk about, uh, you know, sort of the sources of plastic pollution. They'll do some student act activities. Um, and uh, for example, here in lesson one, this is talking, when we're talking about a planet full of plastic. The students, one of the first things they do is this personal waste inventory. Um, and this is a great exercise because um, the teachers actually did this at the beginning of their um, training. And then um, again, at the end, 
Um, Dr. Helen Bailey and myself ran a issue study group for graduate students here at UMSEs, and we had the graduate students do the same thing as well. And so what this, and, and, I, and I think um, this is a, as available online, so you can, um, the, all of these lessons uh, are available and, uh, you know, if you have bored students at home and uh, they want something to do, then, you know, walk them through this uh, lesson plan. It's really quite interesting and um, to actually do your own personal waste in inventory and to see exactly what you're throwing away. And then how much of that is plastic, how much is metal, how much is and uh, you know it really raises awareness to exactly how much you are throwing into the to the landfill um, or you know you might be re recycling but anyway it's a great exercise uh, for all ages so um, I would recommend you to go onto the website and uh, have a look at, look at that ex exercise and then there's also activities on you know how to um, reduce uh, your waste as well so again a lot of activities and I urge you to go to the, that website so I just wanted to touch on some new concerns, of course, and I'm sure you're all aware of this. Of course, masks are incredibly important um, in our time right now, um, but many of them are being improperly um, disposed of. And uh, so there's a lot of um, personal um, protection equipment that is now um, you know, being observed as uh, trash. And uh, you know, along with all the bottles you can see here, this is in a, a beach cleanup, and you can see a number of um, the disposable single-use um, masks and uh, going along with all the other plastic waste there. Um, and in fact, in the, in the Guardian, they uh, ran a story recently that uh, you know, there, was, there was more masks than jellyfish that they could find um, in the ocean where they were sampling. Um, and uh, in fact, in a uh, uh, recent uh, Science article that we're talking about um, accumulation of plastic waste during COVID and uh, environmental science and technology um, paper actually went in, in June 2020 and estimated uh, the number of um, single use masks that are used per month. And you know, they estimated as 129 billion masks used per month, which is essentially, you know, that would cover apparently Switzerland um, in a year. Uh, and you know, there was other estimations that, I, that I've seen you know, in, in Wuhan since the um, uh, coronavirus um, pandemic, they used six times more um, single use waste has been uh, produced. And uh, it's estimated that in the US, they will generate um, a year's worth of single use plastic waste in, in less than um, two months. But you know, just, just, just highlighting, of course, uh, you know, masks are incredibly important, but dispose of them uh, carefully. So what can we do in summary uh, to reduce plastic pollution? I mean, you've seen this, this sign before, you know, refuse, you know, don't, don't, don't use a, a single use um, plastic item. Of course, you know, it's a lot more challenging um, in our current uh, times uh, not, not to, to do that. Um, reduce, uh, you know, use less of the plastic items that you can't do without. You know, reuse them, reuse them again and again, um, recycle, but again, keep in mind that um, only 9% of the uh, plastic items can be um, recycled and there's a limit to recycling. Um, plastics, and it depends on the plastic type, can only be recycled one or uh, you know, a couple of, of times into other alternative products. But the one I like to bring in, you know, I'm just thinking of all, all other R words and now they have that weird bed one, but you know, looking at redesign your lifestyle. I mean, you can think of different ways, which is why I urge you to go do that plastic waste inventory that's uh, on the website, you know, and, and think of ways you can potentially redesign um, your lifestyle to, to, to reduce um, this single use um, plastics. So with that, um, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, some of the team from the Plastic Watch um, project uh, and uh, the, the funders, uh, NOAA, uh, and uh, the Department of uh, Natural Resources, and then a number of um, teachers and teacher supervisors in the Calvert County and St. Mary's um, counties, um, Janelle McPhillips, uh, Jason Hayes, these are the supervisors of science for the uh, two counties, and all of the teachers, great teachers, there's a lot of fun to work with them, 
um, that have been involved in developing and uh, implementing uh, these units in Calvin and St. Mary's County. Um, and they're still ongoing, you know, we are in a virtual uh, learning environment right now, but you know, the, um, the project is still ongoing. Um, and this wave of plastic project was funded by the NOAA Bay Watershed Education and uh, training the, the BWEP program. So with that, I thank you and uh, I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kara. Um, so I'm going to moderate the questions and try and pull groups of them together. So we've had a couple of questions on what happens to plastic as it gets broken down. So the first one from Charles Bennett, after plastic is in the waterways for months to years, does it float, sink, or stay suspended? And then Jim Shepard asks, what do the plastic bottles break down into after the 450 years? Great questions. Um, so if I can remember the first one now. Uh, so uh, it, it, it depends on the plastic item. Um, when plastic is out in um, you know, sunlight, uh, you know, if it's in the water, it's in sunlight, it starts, you, you've, you've probably seen it, if you've left anything out outside and you go to pick up that plastic item, you see it's very brittle. So the plastic tends to, to break down, it gets very brittle, and this is where it breaks down into those medium-sized pieces, and then over time, because you know, if you think of being out in the um, in the in the water, you've got all that wind wave activity. It's banging up against things. It's breaking down into smaller, smaller pieces. But um, it, it very much depends on the the, the type of um, plastic. Uh, getting to the second question, what happens after 450 years? Well, it's not sort of a it, I guess it's a, it, it, you know, it's not a black or white thing. It, you know, it's not a plastic one minute and 450 years later it isn't. I mean, it's just over time, it will gradually degrade into, you know, the, the main components, you know, like your carbon. Um, uh, it just gets broken down. Um, and uh, so as it's going to smaller and more, smaller, smaller pieces, it gets broken down into smaller, smaller, uh, uh, basically it ends up being, you know, a carbon source. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, a question on microplastics and in fiber form from synthetic clothing. Um, how, much of a, how much research is there on microfibers compared to the particulate form? Another great question. Um, well, all of the microplastic work has been, uh, you know, it's rapidly expanded. I mean, I, I had a figure in the presentation earlier that, um, you know, if you look into Google Scholar and you type in the word microplastics and you see over time, you can see it's really in this last decade, you've had this massive exponential um, production of scientific studies and, and papers looking at uh, microplastics. So getting to your, to your question, yes, initially microplastics, they were looking at you know, the harder plastic types. Um, but, and uh, in fact, this opened up a huge um, different um, group of uh, research because microplastics are defined as being um, you know, five millimeters and below. We are now looking at nanoplastics because when they started looking down in the, in the sizes of these things and then they started seeing fibers, um, and then they started, and so these fibers, you know, they can be really, really thin um, and, uh, in, you know, in one dimension, but in other dimensions, um, they, they, you know, they can be any range of uh, sizes. So the most recent research is, um, you know, looking at the uh, microfibers. And there's been a lot of studies. Um, you can actually see these microfibers. You know, you can see them impacted on gills. Um, but they've just been a lot harder to study because they are, you know, a different uh, type of material, a lot thinner. And, as I mentioned before, trying to distangle um, some of the plastics from the environmental matrices is, is you know, is a lot, is, is pretty challenging. So these very thin fibers, this is why they weren't initially seen because, you know, they're really hard to um, tease out. So um, another question from a name you might recognize, this from Eric Davidson. Um, so what is your response to those who question whether too much emphasis has been placed on drinking straws? Are they really quantitatively important 
and I might expand that question to say, or, or, or are they more symbolic? <laughs> That's a really great question. Thanks, Eric. Um, yes, there's arguments on both sides for that. Um, and, uh, you know, what one, one side will argue, well, okay, it's a small percentage. I mean, it's like, you know, 0.1% of the total plastic um, pollution. Um, but, you know, reducing any plastic is, is, is a good thing. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at it in terms of the total pool of plastic out there, um, but then you also have to think about, you know, plastic, uh, how, you know, not one, each plastic doesn't have the same impact as um, another um, plastic. So, uh, but, you know, it, it has been um, seen as to be, you know, the, the biggest problem. Uh, you know, you see that video with the um, turtle with the, the straw in its nose. I mean, how often um, does that happen? But, yeah, I mean, it's a great question and you, and you can argue it both ways. Um, but, yeah, it is a smaller contribution, much smaller contribution than the majority of sources. But, you know, you can argue that the reduction of any plastic um, it, it is uh, you know, a, a way to go. So um, a couple of questions and, and one by way of comment. Uh, we have a couple of people asking about what was the re restaurants that were participating. Um, and I do want to emphasize we're certainly not recommending that those that participated in the experimental group um, are somehow more environmentally conscious or somehow more important. The, the, the control group provided just as much important information to us on the amount of plastic that that was used. And so we want to thank all of the restaurants in Solomons for their um, willingness to partake in, um, in, in this experiment. And, and they, were, they were important. So um, I always like to try and find uh, questions from young pe people. So we have one last question to end the evening from a young lady called Daniela, um, Daniela Radicic. And she says, what happens to the fish when they eat the plastic? So do they die straight away? Does it take a longer time? Or, or what else might happen to the fish that eat the plastic? Well, that's a very great question, Danielle, and uh, it's a really hard one to answer um, because you know it, it depends on what plastic that they have ingested. So whether it's you know a little tiny microblade or whether it's a big bottle cap, and how many of those it is ingested as well. And then the other thing is like how big is your fish? You know, if you have a um, very tiny fish, then you know a few small microbeads might be enough to um, block the stomach um, and, and, uh, um, and you could cause the fish um, to die. Um, but if those mi same microbeads were in a large fish, then it would probably take it in with its food and pass it straight out with no impact. So it very much depends on the type of plastic, the size of plastic, the number of plastic, uh, pieces, I sound like a toxicologist there, and also the, the, the um, fish that you're talking about. Great. Well, Karis, um, we have successfully whiled away another hour on one of these Science for Citizens talks. I um, want to express my thanks to you for giving the presentation. Uh, my thanks to all of the people who joined us tonight. A reminder that the video of this presentation will be posted on our website within a, a few days. Um, if they've had a couple of questions about getting a copy of the presentation, and I'm sure if you contact Sarah Brzezinski, our outreach coordinator, um, she can help you with that. Um, but we do want to thank all of you for your um, enthusiasm this evening. And we want to thank you for participating um, throughout the Science for Citizens presentations. And we encourage you to um, continue your interest uh, in our research, continue your interest in the environment. Um, of course, stay healthy uh, and vote a week from tonight. So thank you all very much, and uh, we hopefully will see you again in the spring. Good night. Good night, everybody.